Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Brian Shapiro, a scientific content specialist at ATCC. Thank you for joining us for the latest installments in the ATCC Excellence in Research webinar series entitled Skin Microbiome, Considerations, Applications, and Future Directions, presented by Dr. Tasha Santiago Rodriguez. Dr. Santiago Rodriguez is a Data Scientist three at Diversigen Inc. In this presentation, Dr. Santiago Rodriguez will discuss the skin's microbiome, focusing on our current understanding of its role and some of the current challenges in studying its taxa. Dr. Santiago Rodriguez will then show how implementation of standards, such as mock communities, can help pinpoint specific biases that could potentially be introduced at different stages of a skin microbiome workflow. If you have any questions for our speaker, please use the chat function available through the webinar program. All questions will be answered as time allows at the end of the presentation. The recorded webinar presentation will be archived on the ATCC website, www.atcc.org. But first, a quick word about ATCC. ATCC is a private nonprofit organization founded in 1925. We are headquartered in Manassas, Virginia, but also have an R&D facility in Gaithersburg, Maryland. ATCC is a leading global supplier of high biological materials, providing the scientific community with a diverse range of industry standard products including microbiome research solution, which leads us to the focus of today's talk, the skin microbiome. So with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Santiago Rodriguez. Thanks, Brian and ATCC for the introduction and for the invitation to talk about the skin microbiome. For today's webinar, I'm going to be giving an introduction to the skin microbiome talk about biases in skin microbiome research, including those related to sample collection, extraction, and amplification, as well as database selection and sequence annotation. And finally, I'm going to be talking about future directions in the field. Let's talk about the skin microbiome first. We know that the skin is essentially our largest organ that can act as a physical barrier. As you can see here in this figure, skin is composed of two layers, including the epidermis and the dermis. The epidermis is composed of very specific cells, which can support the barrier of our skin. And the dermis is composed of many different things, including sweat glands, sebaceous glands, and also hair follicles. We also know that the skin is essentially an ecosystem with different microenvironments with differences in, for example, pH, light exposure, temperature, moisture, and also oil content. All these mentioned components, including sweat and sebaceous glands and hair follicles, can influence the specific conditions that are present across the different skin sites. Skin is also home to a number of different microorganisms that include, for example, bacteria, viruses, and fungi, which are harmless for the most part and offer protection while regulating the immune system, also known as the skin microbiome. The different characteristics of skin can influence the membership and the identity of microorganisms, especially bacteria. For example, more oily sites, such as the forehead, behind the ears, and the nose, may be characterized by bacteria that can consume lipids or oils. Moist sites are characterized by a more acidic environment and include areas such as the groin and the armpits. These areas are characterized by having bacteria from very specific genera, which are also known to contribute to very specific odors. Dry sites, such as the hands, are known to have the greatest bacterial diversity and are also home to a number of different bacteria. Interestingly, although feet may be considered a moist site for the most part, they have their own depiction in this figure, mainly because it is a very unique site. As you will see later in this webinar, toe webs, for example, are different compared to other skin sites. In terms of the fungal communities, as you can see here in this figure, they tend to be more similar across the different skin sites. Also, DNA viruses seem to be more donor-specific rather than being site-specific, which is very consistent with a number of different virome studies. Nevertheless, the skin microbiome is very stable despite constant environmental changes. 
The skin microbiome also has a capacity to protect us against pathogens and can also interact with the immune system in doing so. This figure is showing very specific interactions that demonstrate the function of the skin microbiome in protecting us against invading pathogens. For example, many specific interactions have been identified between bacterial commensals and staph aureus, which is known to be an opportunistic pathogen. This figure is also showing that specific antibiotics produced by other staph species can also inhibit staph aureus. Another example includes the production of antibiotics by certain staph species, which interact with very specific components of the immune system to inhibit staph aureus. Another example includes staph epidermidis, which can inhibit bowel formation by staph aureus with the production of a molecule known as ESP that acts essentially as an endopeptidase. ESP in turn activates very specialized cells to produce antimicrobials, which can kill or lyse staph aureus. And finally, there are also examples showing the opposite of skin bacteria that actually promote pathogen colonization. And this is the case of Codibacterium acnes or C. acnes, which produces a very specific small molecule that promotes biofilm formation by staph aureus. A number of different factors can affect the human skin microbiome. For example, age and biological sex are known to affect the human skin microbiome. We know, for instance, that staph-associated atopic dermatitis seems to decrease with age. We also know that age can influence the skin microenvironment and therefore the bacterial communities. Biological sex, as I mentioned, is also known to affect the skin microbiome. Some of the very early studies related to the skin microbiome showed that biological females had higher bacterial diversity than biological males. Later studies have shown very similar patterns related to sex and the differences between and associated with surface pH, perspiration, and hormone metabolism may be associated with differences between biological males and females. We also know that climate and region can affect the composition of the skin microbiome. For example, studies have noted differences in the skin microbiomes of individuals living in remote versus industrialized areas and have shown that individuals in industrialized regions have a lower intragroup variation. In addition, the immune system, as well as the host genetic composition, can affect the skin microbiome both directly and indirectly. Lifestyle can also affect the composition of the skin microbiome. For example, a study found differences in the skin microbiomes of agricultural workers and those with indoor occupations. This particular study showed that the skin microbiome may reflect soil and aquatic environments in agricultural workers and the built environment, which, which is more human-derived, in individuals with indoor occupations. Underlying conditions such as diabetes can also affect the skin microbiome. For example, a study looking into the skin microbiome of individuals with diabetes noted a significant decrease in bacterial diversity compared to non-diabetic individuals. And finally, another factor that can affect the skin microbiome that is not depicted in this figure is the use of antibiotics. A study showed that the skin microbiome is altered after antibiotic use and can delay wound healing in mice. So when do we acquire our skin microbiomes? So studies have shown that the skin microbiome is acquired at birth and can be modulated by different factors early on in life. Some of these factors include, for example, delivery mode when comparing C-section versus birth canal, the mom's microbiota, antibiotic use, both by the mom and the baby, the use of soaps and detergents, any deficiency in nutrients, mainly vitamin D, housing, animal and pet contact, and also any outdoor play. So then how do we study the skin microbiome? So original studies of the skin microbiome were based on bacterial cultures, which really limited the ability to also understand the identity and the function of those bacteria that couldn't be cultured. For this reason, a very common approach to characterize skin microbial communities relies on amplification, sequencing, and analysis of very specific regions of the 16S ribosomal RNA gene, or 16S gene, which is present in bacteria. This approach has been used in a number of different studies of skin bacterial communities and their relation with health and disease. Next generation sequencing allows for the sequencing of short DNA sequences, so one or more regions of the 16S gene which actually has nine different regions, are selected for sequencing as proxy or model of the whole gene, which has a length of about 1,500 base pairs. For today's webinar, I'm going to be mostly talking about amplification of specific regions of the 16S gene.
It should also be noted that there are other approaches out there that aim to target other microorganisms, including fungi, where regions known as internal transcribed spacer or ITS and ITS2 are usually sequenced and analyzed. Another approach known as whole genome sequencing or shotgun sequencing is also used to characterize bacterial communities in relation to skin health and disease. Whole genome sequencing can also be used to characterize fungi and viruses on skin. A skin microbiome pipeline is actually very similar to any microbiome pipeline in that samples are collected and stored, and we're going to be talking about that. Nucleic acids, usually DNA, are then extracted from the samples. DNA libraries are prepared and sequenced, and finally bioinformatic analysis are performed to understand what's happening. Skin samples, however, may be a little bit more challenging to process and study compared to other sample types. In terms of their microbial recovery, we know that stool samples, for example, have a high microbial load and a low host content. As you can see here on the left side, skin samples, on the other hand, have a low microbial load and a high host content, which can really be a challenge when characterizing microbial communities. As you can see here in the middle section, because of this low microbial content found across different skin sites, DNA yields can be very low, especially for dry areas of the skin. But both dry and moist skin sites usually have and result in lower DNA yields compared to stool samples because, again, of this low microbial content. So this low microbial load and high host content also makes skin samples prone to higher contamination risk, as you can see here in this figure. The other consideration for skin microbiome analysis is the 16S region of interest, as you can see here on the right panel. Variable region 4 or V4 is usually, is usually the preferred region to study stool microbiomes, and variable regions V1 to V3 or V1 V3 are usually preferred to study skin microbiomes. There are several reasons why this is the case, as well as several trade-offs of using one region versus other regions for skin microbiome analysis. For example, even though amplification of the V4 region does not capture certain bacterial taxa, such as C. acnes, without primer editing, and we're going to be talking about that. The V4 region of the 16S gene has the advantage of being widely used, and therefore results can be compared across different body sites and across different studies. Amplification of the V1-V3 regions of the 16S gene is, as I mentioned, the current gold standard in skin microbiome analysis. Even though there are some bioinformatic challenges associated with the longer amplicon length, which is about 500 base pairs, compared to the V4 region, which is about 290 base pairs, Amplification of the V1-V3 region does improve taxonomic classification, especially at the species level. Also, results are usually better correlated with shotgun sequencing results. For all these mentioned reasons, most of the discussion in today's webinar will be based on the V1-V3 regions of the 16S gene. Let's talk about the first step of a skin microbiome pipeline, which is sample collection and biases associated with sample collection. Collection of skin microbiome samples is challenging, but can actually be performed using a number, a number of different methods, for example, the swab, the tape, or biopsy methods. As you can see here in this figure, both the swab and tape collection methods are used to sample the surface of the skin, and the biopsy method will sample different layers of the skin. From these, the swab and the tape collection methods are widely used, mostly because they are less invasive compared to biopsy samples, and both the swab and tape collection methods have advantages and disadvantages. For example, a study showed that although not significant, the swab collection method provides higher DNA yields compared to the tape method, as you can see here on the left panel. The tape method also seems to be better when looking into culturing bacteria under certain conditions, as you can see here on the right panel. However, because of the intrinsic challenge of managing tape samples during the process of DNA extraction, which can also result in lower yields, the swab collection method has become the preferred option. So sampling the skin microbiome can be challenging because of the intrinsic nature of skin being a low microbial high host content sample type. For this reason, our sister company DNA Genotech has developed a standardized skin microbiome collection device known as Omnigene Skin. This swap collection device is very easy to use and contains instructions for use, or IFU, which enables a consistent collection of skin microbiome samples. So essentially, both the tube and the swab are removed from the packaging. The swab is then introduced in the stabilization buffer, and the skin is swapped for 60 seconds with pressure. Again, these instructions are very important because they ensure the consistent collection of skin microbiome samples every single time. 
One of the factors that was looked into during the validation of Omnigene skin was the accuracy to capture similarities and differences across different skin sites. Remember that it was mentioned at the beginning of our webinar that certain areas of the face, for example, may be more oily, and other areas like the forearm and toe webs may be more dry and moist respectively. You can see here a stack bar plot showing the relative abundances of the 20 most abundant bacterial genera across different skin sites that included the face, forearm, and toe web across six different donors. Results showed that for the most part, the face and forearm are characterized by having higher proportions of the genus Woody bacterium, shown here in red, and the toe web is characterized by having higher proportions of the genera Staphylococcus and Corinna bacterium, shown here in blue and yellow respectively. These differences can also be noted in the PICO plot, shown here on the right side, where face and forearm samples group or cluster more closely together compared to toe web samples. The next portion of the Omnigene scheme validation that was looked into was the consistency of the microbial profiles during specific conditions that would mimic storage and shipping. We know that we can't always process a microbiome sample in a specific location at a specific time, and a number of these samples need to be shipped to a specific location, and this unfortunately may sometimes take a couple of days. So here on the left side, you can see a stack bar plot of the relative abundances of the 10 most abundant bacterial genera in phase samples across four different donors. These samples were processed at T0 or baseline and at day 30, and were also stored at room temperature using Omnigene skin. You can see that for the most part, microbial profiles are similar at both time points for each of the donors. The slight differences that you may notice are probably due to the comparison of the left and the right side of the face, which are known to provide slightly different results. On the right side, you can see a very similar plot, but in this case, I'm showing you the microbial profiles of four different donors when samples are stored at 37 degrees and processed at T0 or baseline and also after three days. And again, you can see that the skin microbial profiles are very similar in both cases. To wrap up this section of biases in skin microbiome collection, there should be several considerations when choosing the best collection device, which we also notice when validating Omnigene skin. Keep in mind that an optimal co co collection device needs to be validated across different skin sites, again, dry, oily, and moist. It should contain an optimized information for use, or IFU. It should not contribute to the microbial profiles, meaning that it needs to be low buyer burden. It needs to capture and stabilize the skin microbiome during shipping and storage at room temperature. And finally, it should provide consistent performance and results. Let's talk about biases related to extraction and amplification. Once your skin microbiome samples have been collected, the next step is to extract the DNA. It is known in the microbiome field in general that different extraction methods can add biases to your pipeline, meaning that results can change depending on your approach, and skin microbiome is not the exception. Commercial kits are usually used in skin microbiome research and several different exists out there. These kits may be based on enzymatic treatments and or mechanical lysis, such as beat beating. This particular paper published back in 2019 shows the results of 12 different extraction methods for skin microbiome samples, some of the methods are based on mechanical lysis using different types of beads, and several of the methods combine both mechanical lysis with enzymatic treatments. As you can see here in this table, different amounts of DNA can be obtained from skin samples depending on the extraction kit. For example, kit number eight had probably the highest DNA concentration for skin samples, and kits four and five had probably the lowest. We also know that these results may be dependent on the collection and storing conditions. These results also indicate that it is essential to optimize extraction methods for skin microbiome studies, which fall within the category of what we call low biomass samples. So we have actually already investigated this at Diversogen by comparing our optimized extraction method for low biomass samples with another alternative method. As you can see here in this figure, results show that our optimized DNA extraction method for low biomass samples, shown here in green, does provide better results compared to the alternative method, shown here in gray, including a higher number of 16S copies across different skin sites. This will also guarantee that fewer samples will drop out of the pipeline and more better quality amplicons will be produced. There are several best practices out there for generating amplicons for microbiome studies, including skin microbiome. Some of these include practices that would improve the accuracy in skin microbiome studies. 
For example, optimizing the DNA template concentrations, minimizing the number of cycles in the PCR reaction, using highly processed polymerases, avoiding sequencing primers that overlap with the amplification primers, and using proofreading polymerases are among these practices. So essentially, all of these practices altogether are necessary to ensure unbiased results in skin microbiome research. In terms of the DNA input for analysis, it is important to find that sweet spot. So here at Diversigen, several different concentrations have been tested, and we have looked at how the bacterial taxonomic profiles change across the different concentrations or across a wide dynamic range. You can see here in this figure that with high DNA concentrations, there is also a higher 16S copy number. Yet, results show that virtually there are no changes in the relative abundances of the 15 most abundant bacterial genera across the different concentrations tested, suggesting that results are actually very consistent. Once we had an optimized extraction method, we then processed the skin microbiome samples throughout our optimized library preparation method for low biomass samples. This particular pipeline considers the best practices that we mentioned, including, for example, minimizing the number of PCR cycles, the use of proofreading polymerases, and avoiding sequencing primers that overlap with amplification primers. You can see here in this figure that libraries for each of the skin sites had very similar concentrations regardless of DNA yield. These concentrations were also sufficient for sequencing and downstream analysis. So here on the right side, you can see the taxonomic profiles for the same sample shown on the left. You can see in this stack bar plot that we were able to capture the bacterial genera expected to be present across the different skin sites. For example, you can see that the scalp samples are characterized by having higher proportions of hooded bacterium, shown here in green, and toe web samples are characterized by having higher proportions of corinobacterium, shown here in blue. To wrap up this section of biases in skin sample processing, including DNA extraction and amplification, again, there should be several considerations. Keep in mind that any extraction kit should be validated across different skin sites, again, dry, oily, and moist, and optimized to maximize DNA yields and 16S copy number. Extraction and amplification methods should capture the expected skin microbiomes across a range of DNA concentrations. And finally, there should be consistent performance which will be dependent on the number of PCR cycles, polymerases, and primers used. Once we have collected the skin microbiome samples and extracted the DNA, the next step is to analyze the data. However, we know that there are biases that are also associated with data analysis, so let's talk about some of these biases today. We know that in the microbiome field, different annotation tools and databases can influence taxonomic classifications. For example, on the left side of this figure, you can see the true composition of a synthetic microbiome sample and its composition when using different annotation tools, including in this case, Kraken, Bracken, and Shime. This figure also shows the composition of that same sample when using different 16S databases, including, as you can see, Green Genes, Silva, and RDP. You can see that overall there is an effect on the composition of the synthetic microbiome sample uh, sample across the different annotation tools and databases tested. Unfortunately, there are limited studies out there looking at the effects of different annotation tools and databases for skin microbiome research. Therefore, I would say that more studies are, are still needed. Even though we have limited information on the effect of different annotation tools and, and databases on skin microbiome studies, we know that, as I mentioned, the selection of the 16S variable region can influence results. For example, this figure shows a cluster heat map of the relative abundances of a mock community composed of 18 different bacterial species. Results show that amplification of the V4 region of the 16S gene resulted in an overrepresentation of staph aureus and an underrepresentation of other species, including C. acnes and staph epidermidis, as you can see here. More recent studies have shown that, in fact, if the primers targeting the V4 region of the 16S gene are modified, C. acnes can then be identified, and I'm going to be talking about that in a few moments. In addition, results show that amplification of the V1, V3 regions of the 16S gene can better capture the expected proportions of these mock communities. Going back to the topic of editing PCR primers targeting the V4 region of the 16S gene, we have recently demonstrated that one specific changes have been made to the primers so that differences in the V4 region are captured, then species such as C. acnes can be identified. 
So here on the left side, you can see box plots of the proportions of C. acnes in face and, and scalp samples when using edited V1, V3 primers, shown here in blue, edited V4 primers, shown here in green, and also on edited V4 primers, shown here in yellow. You can see that the proportions of C. acnes are much higher when using the edited versions of either the V1, V3 and V4 primers. On the right side, you can see a stack bar plot of bacterial taxa across eight different subjects. And again, you can see that Curibacterium is being identified once the V4 primers have been edited to capture the sequence differences. Again, this demonstrates essentially that if wanted, the V4 region can still be used in skin microbiome analysis. Regardless of the variable region of interest, it is well known in the microbiome field that there are limitations when using 6NS amplicon information for species classification. S specifically, we know that taxonomic classifiers usually provide information up to the genus level. For example, you can see here in this plot some of the most common staph species as part of several skin sites. In this case, 59% of the staphs were classified at the species level using a classifier known as RDP. This means that several skin bacteria were not classified at the species level. We know that essentially species level resolution is very important in microbiome research for a number of different reasons, for example, to discriminate between bacterial pathogens and commensals. Several methods, including one known as phylogenetic placement algorithm, has been employed to obtain species level resolution from 16S information, but with little success. So we have actually developed a pipeline for species level resolution from V1, V3 information using an alignment-based algorithm. As part of this validation process, we used a ground truth sample. And in this case, we used ATCC's MSA-1005 mod community, which is composed of six different bacterial species known to inhabit the human skin. You can see here in the stack bar plot, the expected proportions for each of these bacteria, which are in equal proportions or concentrations, as well as our results across six different replicates. Results show that overall, our pipeline was actually able to capture all six bacteria expected to be part of ATCC's mock community in concentrations that were actually very consistent across the different replicates included in this study. In terms of more complex samples, our pipeline was also able to capture a greater number of species compared to another approach, which was included here for comparison. So here in the left column, you can see the species names for ATCC's MSA-1002 mod community, which is composed of 20 different bacterial species. The interesting aspect of using this particular mock community for the validation of our pipeline is that there are two staphs and two strep species, which can mimic a difficult sample for species level classification. You can see in the middle column the results for the alternative approach, and on the right column you can see the results for our method. Results in green represent the detection of the organism at the species level, yellow represents the detection of the organism at the genus level, and red indicates that the organism was not identified at any level. You can see that for the other approach, it was able to classify 7 out of the 20 bacteria in the mock community at the species level, but our approach was able to classify 18 out of the 20 bacteria in the mock community at the species level. This also means that 12 out of the 20 bacteria were not classified at the species level when using the other approach, and only one bacterium was not classified at the species level when using the, our approach. This also means that there was also one false negative when looking at both approaches. This may be due to a number of different factors, including, for example, biases related to primer amplification. When looking at a toe web sample, you can see on the left column results of several bacterial taxa classified using the alternative approach. And on the right column, you can see results of several bacterial taxa classified using our approach. Under lines, you're going to see several bacterial species that were captured using both approaches. Highlighted in bold, you're going to see that for the most part, Divergence approach was able to identify several bacteria up to the species level, which was not the case for the other approach. You can also see highlighted in bold a number of different staffs that were not identified at the species level when using the other approach, but that were actually identified at the species level when using our approach. These results are essentially suggesting that when validating an annotation pipeline, it is again very important to include that ground truth sample as we did when validating our skin microbiome pipeline using both ATCC's MSA 1005 and 1002 mock communities. 
To wrap up this section of biases in skin microbiome associated with databases and annotation tools, there should be several considerations. Keep in mind that databases should be updated and curated on a regular basis, and they should provide reliable classifications at the genus and species levels when possible. In terms of the annotation tools, keep in mind that these should provide consistent results across different skin sites and conditions, and they should be able to minimize the number of false positives, false negatives, and also any unclear classifications. As we continue optimizing skin microbiome research from sample collection to data analysis, additional techniques can be considered for the analysis of skin microbiome samples to, for example, let's say, dig deeper into health and disease, determine uh, any multi-kingdom interactions, and also develop therapeutic approaches. So let's talk about some of these in more detail. Although we know that 16S sequencing is among the preferred methods for skin microbiome research, Standardization of other approaches will also enable the study of skin microbiome samples in relation to skin health and disease. As with 16S sequencing, implementation of shotgun sequencing or any other OM, including, for example, metatranscriptomics and metabolomics into skin microbiome research requires standardization of the different steps of the pipeline, again, from sample collection down to data analysis. As mentioned, a great part of this standardization process involves the addition of a control sample, like, let's say, a mock community. Once current and emerging technologies for skin, for skin microbiome research are standardized, then new and reliable information can be acquired in a more systematic way. For instance, we know that shotgun sequencing provides information of not only bacterial species and strains, but also of viruses, fungi, and other microbes. We know essentially that getting this information is important because then we can understand how these microbes are working in, in maintaining health or promoting disease. For, for example, in this heat map on the left, you can see the relative abundances of bacterial species in relation to skin health and disease across different skin sites. In a similar way, genes related to metabolism, antibiotic resistance, and virulence, just to mention some examples, can be studied using techniques such as shotgun sequencing. For example, in this heat map on the right, you can see the relative abundances of genes related with different types of metabolism in relation to skin health and disease. Interesting studies have shown potential interactions between the skin microbiome and organisms of other life domains, also known as multi-kingdom interactions. These studies have also shown that skin health and disease may actually be a function of these interactions with the immune system. So this particular study shown in the figure supports the idea that the intensity and quality of immune responses to the microbiota under both health and in relation to inflammation are controlled by the expression of endogenous retroviruses, which we know are part of our genomes. It has been suggested that under a healthy state, the expression of endogenous retroviruses is, is more discrete, but during inflammation, the expression of endogenous retroviruses is actually higher. These results are indeed very interesting and open the opportunity to understand more about the potential role and interactions across not only bacteria, but also viruses, fungi, and other microbes in relation to skin health and disease. And finally, developing therapeutics for dermal diseases is probably one of the long-term goals of skin microbiome research. For these types of approaches, ideally, skin swaps are collected from both healthy controls and patients at sites showing signs of the disease. Then the skin samples are sequenced and results are compared. Differences between case and controls can then be used to generate hypotheses of any potential microbial drivers of the disease of interest. Isolates of interest should also be ideally cultured from patients using targeted culture conditions. Bacterial or any other microbial isolate from the patients should then be tested in preclinical models that are relevant to the disease using, for example, mouse models. If the microorganism can capture features of the disease, then more experiments could be performed to explore the mechanism of action of that particular microorganism. So depending on the results from all the mentioned steps, a therapeutic could be developed and tested. Also, a similar model could be used to identify beneficial microorganisms that are actually present in controls but are lacking in patients and could be potentially used as probiotics. So what's next for skin microbiome research? As, as we develop methods to standardize skin microbiome research, again, from sample collection down to data analysis, we can, for example, keep expanding our understanding regarding the membership and function of the skin microbiome in relation to skin health and different dermal diseases. We can also, for example, layer information onto metagenomic, metatranscriptomics, and metabolomic data sets to provide new biological and clinical insights. 
We can also, for example, continue any improvements related to sample collection, stabilization, extraction and detection assays, first scale microbiome research. And finally, we can also understand any potential effects of novel treatments to the skin microbiome. And with that, I can take any questions. Oh, thank you, Tasha, for the excellent presentation. In just a few moments, we will begin our Q&A session. Please use the chat function available for the webinar program to submit your questions. And uh, remember, the recorded webinar presentation will be available on demand on the ATCC website at www.atcc.org. So we've already had a, quite a few questions come in. Let's go ahead and start with first. So Tasha, what are the advantages and disadvantages of sequencing certain regions of the 16S gene versus shotgun sequencing versus full-length 16S sequencing for skin microbiome analysis? Yeah, so that's a, a great question, although we talk about mostly about analyzing certain regions of the 16S gene in today's webinar. I would say that other approaches like full lens 16S sequencing and shotgun sequencing do have a number of different advantages in, in skin microbiome research. When we talk about full lens 16S sequencing, we are actually trying to get a better resolution, uh, mostly at the species level. We, we mentioned very briefly in the webinar that trying to get that species level resolution is very important in skin microbiome research for a number of different reasons. For example, when you're trying to uh, differentiate between bacteria that can cause disease, and, and those are actually commensals. Um, I would say also that full lens 16S sequencing seems to be uh, very helpful to get species level resolution from bacteria that are very hard to classify when you've seen, for example, only the V4 region of the 16S, and we're talking about, for example, uh, different Clostridium, uh, Bifidobacterium, and different stats. Uh, in terms of the disadvantages, we know that 16S sequencing, either the full length gene or different regions of the gene, usually cannot provide information of, of other microbes like viruses, fungi, and genes related to, uh, for example, uh, metabolism, antibiotic resistance, and virulence factors, just to mention some examples. Um, also, I think it's, it's worth mentioning that we are working on a solution to get shotgun sequencing information from skin microbiome samples. And as I mentioned very briefly, we know that shotgun sequencing provides information of, of viruses and fungi on skin, which uh, some of you may be interested in. I would say the main disadvantage of using shotgun sequencing for low biomass samples is usually the amount of host DNA that you can sequence unless very specific changes are made to the pipeline as we are working on here at Diversigen. Okay. Now you talked a little bit about some of the um, disadvantages, um, where the particular use cases or case studies where full-length 16S sequencing is seen to be advantageous for, for skin microbiome sequencing? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, the, the case studies and different applications for full-length 16S sequencing, I would say, can go from very simple to more complex. And again, the main aim of sequencing the full 16S gene is to get species level resolution. So one example that comes to mind, and I talk about it in the webinar a little bit, is developing therapeutics for dermal conditions like, like acne, which we know is, is caused for the most part by C. acne. So to develop a therapeutic to treat dermal conditions like acne, you need to know the exact organism that is causing the disease to have better outcomes. Um, another similar example was published last year, and the authors applied uh, full lens 16S sequencing to uh, differentiate across different staph species. We know, for example, that staph aureus causes atopic dermatitis in children and adults, but other staphs, like staph hominis, which is a skin commensal, can actually kill staph aureus. So this very interesting dynamic and competition between staph aureus and staph hominis has been looked as a potential way to treat uh, skin conditions caused by, by Staph aureus. So in this case, you really need to know the difference and differentiate between the two Staphs, which is usually very hard to do with just amplification of certain regions of the 16S gene, like the V4 region. All right, good, good. Now, 
can you talk about what are the issues of having a uh, high relative amounts of post DNA and skin samples and how do you overcome them and how do you overcome them at diversity? Yeah, so that's a very important question. Uh, as I mentioned during the webinar, one of the main disadvantages of skin samples is having high host DNA and lower microbial content compared to other sample types like, let's say, stool samples. The main issue uh, is that the more host DNA you have, then the less microbial DNA you'll get. I would say that one of the main ways to avoid this is by actually optimizing your DNA extraction method to enhance and get more microbial DNA. Okay. Um, and what's the uh, another um, diversogen uh, question? What's the lower limit of detection of diversogen's low biomass pipeline for um, the microbiome samples? Yeah, that, that's a great question. In terms of uh, the 16S copy number, it really depends on the site, and I think I showed that very briefly. But it's around 10,000 copies. Okay, and um, the, this question actually sounds like a couple of questions that have come in, um, but what are the current skin and other microbiome mock communities, oh, sorry, are the current skin and other microbiome mock communities sufficient regarding the complexity and diversity of organisms? Yeah, that's a very important question. I would say uh, in terms of, of the mock communities, there is really no one size fits all solution for developing mock communities in, in general for microbiome research, including, of course, skin microbiome. I would say that the standards that we have right now do what they intend to do just to make sure that your microbiome pipeline is reliable. And again, their applications may change depending on the goal of your study. We must make sure that all the steps of the microbiome pipeline, including skin microbiome, are standardized from the moment you collect your samples down to when you're analyzing the data. And that's probably one of the reasons why ATCC and other organizations are developing different standards for microbiome research. And probably the reason why we always include these small communities in diversity. But I also suspect that we will continue to see a lot of, this, of these different standards evolving and changing with time. Okay, good, good. Now, for many years, uh, it's been acceptable to perform and publish microbiome data, including skin microbiome, without including controls and standards. Should this be required before microbiome studies, including my, the skin microbiome? Uh, are accepted for publication. Yeah, thanks for, for bringing that up. And it, it's a very good point. I, as a lot of you may know, for the longest time, microbiome data, including skin microbiome and, and studies, were published without controls. So I would say that moving forward, adding a standard like a mock community is something that should probably be required somehow for publication, just to make sure that there are no biases that are related with any steps of your pipeline. Also, in the case of skin microbiome, because, again, it's a low biomass sample, it is going to be essential to add a blank or an extraction control just to make sure that there is little to no background noise or any bacteria that are affecting your skin microbiome profiles. Also, I wanted to add that even if, if the study that you're using right now uses pipelines that have been benchmarked before using a standard like a mock community, I, I think the use of standards needs to continue somehow because there are other biases that we usually forget or not, not think about, like changing the technician from day to day, a new batch of reagents, uh, problems during the transport or shipping of the samples to the lab. All these things can affect your, your results. So it's very, it's very important to add these uh, controls even if your pipeline has been benchmarked. Okay. Now, um you mentioned um, background signal um, when you were talking, answering the last question. So I'm going to jump to this next question since it's sort of related. Uh, what level of background signal, if any, is present when processing a blank or negative control sample from start to finish? Yeah, that's a very good point. And let me talk a little bit more about the blank controls because I really didn't talk about them uh, too much. 
uh, I would say that blank controls, they need to be added to your skin microbiome pipeline because, again, skin is a low biomass sample. And as we showed in the webinar, skin samples are more prone to contamination compared to other samples. If your blank control shows any signs of contamination, especially those related to your sample of interest, for example, if your blank control is showing skin bacteria, then, then you know that there are issues that need to be addressed. So, for example, here in Diversogen, we always add a blank control from the moment the samples are extracted just to make sure that there is no background contamination from uh, the reagents, for example, or, or any cross-contamination. Um, in my experience, uh, the blank controls usually show uh, negligible DNA concentrations that, let's say, fail PCR amplification, which is what you want. If there is significant background contamination, you will have to make sure to understand where this contamination is coming from, which could be, again, from your reagents used uh, during the extraction of DNA. It could be from your primers, and even the water that you use for the reactions can be a source of contamination. Okay. Now, um, I guess since we're still talking about background, uh, I guess this is a, a good question. Um, are there particular skin sites that are at higher risk for being influenced by background signals? Like, um, you know, for example, the endogenous yields from those sites are too low to significantly overcome the background. Yeah, that's a good question. I would say yes, and I think I mentioned it, mentioned it very briefly in the webinar that dry skin sites are uh, usually more prone to contamination risk. So again, this is why it's, it's going to be so important to add that blank just to make sure no background or very negligible background is in your sample. But once you make sure to add that blank control and follow all the best practices for amplicon sequencing that we mentioned, you should be able to capture the endogenous skin microbiota from your skin samples. Okay. Now, can you talk about some of the challenges in getting reproducible and or comprehensive antimicrobial resistance signals from skin microbiome analyses? That's a very interesting question and topic, uh, I'm sure, for another webinar. But I would say that there are two main challenges that I can think of, uh, which are sequencing depth and the host content. Uh, since antimicrobial resistant genes usually make up such a small percentage of the sequences in your metagenomic sample, it's going to be challenging trying to find that sweet spot of getting enough coverage to identify all these resistant genes and the different classes in your sample. And then in skin microbiomes, we have the additional challenge of the host DNA, which can probably get in your way of detecting antimicrobial resistance uh, signals. So again, finding that balance in sequencing depth is going to be very important to characterize antimicrobial resistant profiles from skin microbiomes. All right, so stay tuned, folks. Maybe we'll have a webinar around that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, I guess back to work. Um, is the analysis of the skin microbiota relevant to clinical areas? This is kind of a, a broad question, but uh, I would love to have your insight on that. Yeah, I think for sure, absolutely. As, as I mentioned, for example, developing therapeutics for skin conditions like acne, atopic dermatitis, is very important and requires the development of these clinical models uh, or preclinical pre models which need to be characterized. Uh, wound healing also comes to mind, and we know it is a very interesting process when we look at all the components necessary for wound healing to happen. We know uh, from different studies that wound healing depends on the skin microbiota to different extents. Um, there, these studies have found also that wound healing is actually faster in, in wild-type mice or normal mice compared to germ-free mice or those lacking a microbiota. Um, also, as a fun fact, I read the other day that there are other studies that have noted that uh, wound healing also takes longer in space. So this is probably showing that there are more factors out there that affect wound healing, and we haven't really looked into them in, in much detail. Nice, nice. Um, so then this question actually kind of hones in more to a specific 
kingdom. Um, are there any applications of the skin microbiome when looking at specific viruses or the virome? Yeah, this is a great point, and I would say yes. Uh, the study that I mentioned in the webinar about how endogenous retroviruses control immune responses through the skin microbiota is probably an example that comes to mind. There was also a very interesting study that was published actually four months ago that, that noted that the skin microbiota has a lot to do with how we respond to vaccination against smallpox. So essentially, the study found that germ-free mice uh, don't develop the wounds associated with smallpox vaccination as much as, as, as the normal mice. So it seems like somehow normal mice recruit more skin bacteria in the area where the vaccination took place. So I thought this was very interesting and essentially it's suggesting that the skin microbiota is heavily associated somehow with a better response to better to certain vaccines. Um, and also, even though I haven't seen studies looking at the skin microbiota and, and, and monkeypox infections yet, I suspect that this may be ongoing somehow since we know that monkeypox is transferred through uh, direct contact. We know that the skin microbiota communicates with the immune system and it is very involved in how our immune system responds to infection. So I wouldn't be surprised to see studies looking at the association between monkeypox infection and the skin microbiota in the future. Okay. Now this next question is for uh, CSI fans. Um, can the skin microbiome be used in forensic applications? I would, I would think so. Uh, even though I didn't talk about this in the webinar, there are actually a number of papers out there that have looked at the skin microbiota and how skin bacteria can be traced by looking at, at the objects that have been touched by the different individuals. And that particular study that I'm thinking about also showed that the corresponding skin bacteria could be identified in, in the objects touched by an individual for actually up to two weeks. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Good to know. Good to know. All right. Well, we've had uh, quite a few questions come in today. So um, let's uh, get back to this. Um, which method of DNA extraction is best best for analyzing skin microbes? I mean, I think that you covered some of this earlier, but yeah. So that's that's a good question. Um... In terms of the best method, I think it's going to be the one that enhances the amount of DNA from the microbes of interest. And of course, that it's, it's consistent across different skin sites. Again, as I mentioned in the webinar, dry, oily, and moist. Okay. All right. Um, now for this next question, um, the asker is looking for healthy and atopic dermatitis microbiome samples. And they'd like to know if there's a biobank for disease state microbiome samples um, that can be provided to them. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, at the top of my head, I don't know if any biobanks for disease state for skin I know of, of, I think, stool samples, uh, but I think it's going to be a great opportunity for, I think, APCC to develop some type of, of standard that would mimic certain skin conditions for sure. Yeah, I would agree. Um, and uh, our product manager um, that, that covers this area can, can reach out to the asker um, to, to talk uh, more specifically uh, about this and, and um, maybe you learn a little bit more about the requirements uh, um, for development for this. So th thank you for that. Okay. Um, now, uh, this next question seems to be two parts from the, the asker. Um, how does the skin microbiome, how can it help in precision medicine and then advanced diagnostics? Yeah, that, that's a that's a great question. I think I kind of talked about it in, in one of the previous questions, but again, wound healing is very important, acne, atopic dermatitis. So I think uh, to different extents, skin microbiome can really help in precision medicine for sure. Okay. And um, 
what's the biggest challenge do you think in um uh, wgs shotgun sequencing for skin is it um low bio burden yeah that, that's a great question and i think we we probably cover some of it in in the q a at the beginning uh, one of the main challenges is the, the high host content um, and and also trying to, to get to that sweet spot of the sequencing depth, which is going to be very important in, in skin microbiome and shotgun sequencing. Okay. Now, um, how would you determine the um, microorganisms from ocular surfaces? I guess, you know, from the the cornea of the eye, for example, or the yeah. sclera? That, that's a very interesting question, and I have to admit I don't have much experience with the eye microbiome, but I suspect it's, it's a low biomass as well. So I, I hopefully a lot of the uh, things that we talk about in the webinar would apply to, to the eye microbiome somehow. Yeah, I would, I would think so, too. I would think so, too. Um, Ah, for this next question, I, I kind of like this. Is there any correlation or connection between the gut microbiome and skin microbiome? That, that's, a, that's a great question for sure. Um, I haven't really seen any papers correlating both microbiomes. Um, if there are correlations, I would suspect these are very interesting for sure, but I, I really haven't seen any studies. Okay, and um, let's see, for uh, the next question, um, how does the bias from 16S amplification compare to the bias from the library prep in shotgun sequencing? Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm guessing the question is it's asking trying to compare 16S amplicon versus shotgun sequencing. Um, so I guess in terms of the library prep, this is probably a question more for, for the wet lab team. Um, but again, a lot of the different uh, biases that I talk about, like low biomass, uh, getting enough microbial DNA, are going to apply to both 16S and shotgun sequencing. Okay. And um, I actually on purpose jumped over uh, the last question because it's uh, 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 directly related to an ATCC product, and I needed to look up the answer. Um, for <laughs> ATCC uh, um, <laughs> microbiome standard products, how stable is the mock microbiome for lab culturing? How does the composition change after a couple rounds of culture? And can the population be maintained in chemostat? So, so the second two questions, um, I'm not sure about the answer, but um, we can have a, a product um, manager or technical service representative reach out to you, and I'll make a specific note to do that. But um, as as far as the stability of it of it for culturing, um, the product format comes to you freeze dry. So um, at least as far as before you start growing it, it should be um, stable pretty much indefinitely. So, um, okay, let's uh, jump uh, over to um, Tasha. Which is the best methodology or kit for microbial DNA isolation for metagenomics? Uh, in terms of the kits, um I'm not. I'm not really sure about the names. I shouldn't disclose any of them here. But uh, as I as I showed in the webinar, Diversigen has has come up with with a very good solution to get the the most amount of of microbial DNA for your skin microbiome pipeline. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, similar to including a mock community, shouldn't studies also include blank? and environmental samples to capture contaminants? And do you subtract these out in your normal samples in your pipeline? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. Um, so ideally, as I mentioned, um, 
you should include the blank control at, at the beginning of your pipeline from the moment you extract the, the DNA from your skin samples just to make sure that there are no contaminants from your reagents or the primers or water. Uh, so always add the blank control. Um, in terms of the environmental samples, I'm not sure um, if you're referring to including a sample like that in the actual pipeline, but I think any control that you can add that will help you analyze your data uh, at the end of the day, I think it's going to be very important. I, I usually don't suggest to remove the sequences from your from your blanks. Um, I know like with 16S data, you can do that very easily with Chime, for example, let's say from shotgun data, it's a little bit more complicated, but um, my recommendation is not to do it if, if really you don't have to do it. Okay, good, good. Um, so for this next question, first of all, they say excellent presentation. But um, they would like more information on lipid-dependent yeast, for example, um, malassezia and um, keratinolytic fungi. Uh, can you comment at all on state-of-the-art sampling and detection of these? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, I, I really, I really don't don't know the answer for that one. Okay, no, fair enough, fair enough. Um, all right. So, are there batch effects created by mixing skin sample types, like dry and oily sites with different copy numbers? Um, is the normalization going to cause issues if batch? Uh, yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, there shouldn't be batch effects if you're processing your samples when you're preparing the the, the library. Um, usually, you see batch effects when you have processed and analyzed your samples at different moments during different times with different technicians sometimes. But usually, if it's the same technician uh, that have prepared the samples for library prep the same day using the same techniques, there shouldn't be a batch effect. Okay. Now, um, this question is about a specific genus. Uh, is something known about Raustonia in context with the skin microbiome? For example, um, can this genus be considered a contaminant due to a uh, low biomass or the, uh, a normal part of the skin microbiome? Yeah, that, that's a great, a great question. I am not very familiarized with the with the genus, but I uh, I think we probably have to see if you see it consistently in in your reagents. I know of some bacteria that are intrinsically present in your in your reagents that you use during DNA extraction. Uh, so I think we should probably have to check your your blank controls that you use during the process of DNA extraction, just to make sure that this is not coming from from uh, your reagents somehow. Okay. Um, wow, a lot of questions come in still. Uh, this this next question is kind of interesting, and it's related to probiotics. So there's uh, many skin probiotics in the market now. Are those containing scientifically correct organisms, or is there a big gap between scientific findings and the products? That, that's a great question. I have seen some some probiotics for skin. Um, I will be curious to know how how was the research and development done for sure. Hopefully, it's on point uh, with the literature and what we know so far. Okay. And um, then bouncing from abroad to a specific technical question: uh, How many sequences per samples is ideal? for 16S analysis. Sorry, can you repeat the question? Sure, sure. How many sequences per samples is ideal for 16S analysis? 
Yeah, that's a great question. I, I didn't talk about it. Um, we have a limit here in diversogen, some type of quality control. I would say something between 5,000 to 10,000 should be should be good to coverage. Probably a little bit less for skin since it's a low biomass environment. Okay. Um, back to uh, broad questions. Is there any correlation between skin microbiome and skin cancer? Uh, yeah, that, that's a great question. The studies that I've seen so far with, with skin cancer have been actually with the gut microbiome, um, and they have noted specific taxa that have been associated with that, but I haven't seen papers uh, that, have a, that have correlated both of them, so I think that should probably be a very good study. Okay. Uh, this question kind of bounces back to something that was asked earlier, um, and so you could answer it the same way if you'd like, but is there convincing evidence that the skin microbiome changes in parallel with the intestinal microbiome, say, during age or disease? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question again. Um, I haven't seen studies looking at both of them, but again, I suspect uh, if we see changes, for example, with the gut microbiome and, and age, there should be changes with the skin microbiome and, and age as well. And I mentioned that at the beginning of the webinar, uh, but looking at both of them at the same time, it would be very interesting to do. Okay. And um, here's uh, a, a very technical question. Um, do you have to do amplifications for a whole genome shotgun, or do you just sequence to greater depth? Okay, can you re repeat the first part? I'm sorry, I think um, I didn't get it. Sure. Do you, you have to do AMP, which I think is short for amplification in this context, uh, for the mm -hmm. whole genome shotgun, or do you just sequence to greater depth? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. I think I mentioned sequencing depth at some point. Um, so we don't we don't do amplification of of the DNA in skin microbiomes. Uh, we, we know, for example, from virome sequencing that when you amplify the genomes, you can get some biases towards certain DNA viruses. Um, so I would suspect if you do that with skin microbiomes and shotgun sequencing, you can get some biases towards certain. Uh, bacterial species versus other species. Uh, so in, in that sense, then you, you will have to find that, that balance, as I mentioned, of, of getting enough sequencing coverage to detect all the microorganisms that you probably are expecting from your skin microbiome samples. Okay, good, good. Now, um, this uh, next question is around um, experimental design. So um, is designing an in vitro experiment, uh, will it be helpful in identifying the skin pathogens? Can we use specific ATCC species and try to enrich the growth of these species, followed by identifying the gene expression? Yeah, that's, that's a very interesting question. Um, I, I, I don't see why not. Um, I'm not very familiarized with in vitro experiments so far, but I, I know they're very much needed in skin microbiome research. So I think adding adding that control will be interesting uh, to see um, during an in vitro experiment for skin microbiome research. Okay. Um, and then uh, we have one final question that, that we'll address today. Uh, so. Tasha, you focus primarily on skin disease and the skin microbiome, but do changes in skin microbiome influence or correlate with other conditions beyond classic skin disorders? And um, perhaps, you know, she might, or they might mean um, disorders of um, the, you know, central nervous system maybe, or digestive system or whatnot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a very great, great question, and, and hopefully I can see more studies like that. I know it's like the, the opposite of 
of gut uh, micro, uh, microbiomes being correlated somehow with uh, with skin conditions, but not not the opposite. So, for sure, we need more studies like that. Okay. Well, um, a great engagement today uh, with the Q and A session. Th thanks everyone for for your questions. Uh, at at this time, we'll go ahead and conclude the Q&A session. So I'd like to thank Tasha for the excellent presentation, and thank you everyone for attending this webinar. Uh, for more information about Diversogen's microbiome offerings, uh, you can visit info at diversogen.com or uh, diversogen.com slash services slash skin microbiome. And for more information about ATCC's microbiome standards, navigate to www.atcc.org slash microbiome. And then finally, for a, a shameless bit of self-promotion, uh, ATCC now has a podcast that I produce. So please be sure to listen, like, uh, and follow or subscribe to Behind the Biology. You can find that at www.atcc.org slash behind the biology. Thank you again, everyone, and have a great day.